The modern lifestyle can make it easy for us to forget that the way we feel is significantly influenced by internal biological factors. And it is important for us to keep a balanced biology, otherwise we will feel bad. This balance I'm referring to is in large part metabolically, hormonally, electrochemically governed by our circadian rhythms, which are natural endogenous processes that regulate the sleep-wake cycle and repeat in tune with the rotation of the earth every 24 hours. These rhythms are driven by a circadian clock that is deeply ingrained in our biology and further has been widely observed in plants, animals, fungi, and even cyanobacteria. As you may have already inferred, circadian rhythms are inherently cyclical. And so behaviorally, they influence our daily routines, notably when we wake up, socialize, get sunlight and sleep, among many other things. And so a lack of routine in this sense results in dysregulated circadian rhythms, which results in biological imbalance, which results in feeling bad. Now, as potentially already indicated, there are a lot of moving parts at play here. So in this video, I am only going to focus on what I feel are some of the more common disruptions to circadian rhythms that can be controlled for, mainly related to sleep and cognitive functioning, as insomnia and depression are secondary symptoms related to subjects in my other videos, and I have received comments asking me to address coping with them. So to start, levels of blue light in our environment impact wakefulness by interacting with our circadian clocks. Blue light being mostly and naturally emitted from the sun. And so our patterns of wakefulness have evolved in tune with the patterns of the sun. And modern light sources can disrupt this natural alignment of patterns, contributing to insomnia. Restated more specifically, in humans, the master circadian clock is contained within what is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, an evolutionarily ancient nerve cluster of about 20,000 neurons located in the hypothalamus of our brains. The suprachiasmatic nucleus regulates the production of melatonin, the hormone that makes you feel sleepy through a negative feedback loop. As an input, the nucleus receives signals from specialized photosensitive cells in the retina, which react to levels of blue light in one's environment. As an output, the excited suprachiasmatic nucleus prevents the production of melatonin by the pineal gland to various degrees. As blue light levels decrease in your environment, more melatonin production is allowed. This is the negative feedback loop I was talking about before. Unnatural levels of blue light from modern sources such as light fixtures and screens trigger reactions in these photosensitive cells that relay excitatory signals to the suprachiasmatic nucleus at inappropriate times of day, throwing off our circadian clock and rhythms. Generally, this causes you to have a harder time falling asleep at night as your body does not really feel that it is nighttime in the natural way it's supposed to. Over time, this can contribute to insomnia. And further, if melatonin patterns are unbalanced, it can potentially contribute to depression over time, as melatonin is part of the serotonin cycle of our bodies. L-tryptophan, an essential amino acid, is the precursor to 5-HTP, also technically an amino acid, which is in turn the precursor to serotonin. And serotonin is the precursor to melatonin. You see within the pineal gland, serotonin is acetylated and methylated to yield melatonin. And so by turning off or filtering these blue light yielding devices and or wearing blue light filtering glasses or even wearing a face mask at approximately nine o'clock at night, the time where melatonin secretion begins in our bodies according to the average decadian clock, you can help correct these disruptions that I'm talking about. But Unnatural light levels are just one of the ways that modern lifestyle can disrupt sleep patterns and your circadian clock. Another major way is with caffeine intake. As you may know, caffeine makes you feel more awake, alert, energized, and it accomplishes this by acting as an adenosine antagonist. So what is adenosine? Well, adenosine is an organic compound present in the human body. One of its primary derivatives is adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP which is commonly talked about in most biology classes as the energy currency of the body's various cellular functions. When ATP is used, it degrades and releases free adenosine. Specifically, the brain's activity when you are awake consumes a lot of ATP, stored as glycogen, and hence causes adenosine to build up throughout the day. The accumulation of adenosine contributes to the feeling of physical tiredness. 
As an adenosine receptor antagonist, caffeine binds the same receptors as adenosine, preventing it from binding itself and exerting its hypnogenic biological response, preventing you from feeling tired. Further, when caffeine binds to these adenosine receptors, instead of slowing down because of the adenosine effect, the nerve cells speed up. Caffeine's effect on the brain causes increased neuron firing. Consequentially, the pituitary gland senses its activity and thinks some sort of emergency must be occurring. So it releases hormones that tell the adrenal glands to produce adrenaline or epinephrine. Adrenaline is the fight or flight hormone and it has a number of effects in your body. And this explains why after consuming a big cup of coffee, your hands may get cold, your muscles may grow tense, you may feel excited and your heart may race faster. This is how caffeine acts as a stimulant. So how does this impact sleep patterns exactly? Because, you know, as long as I don't consume caffeine right before bed, it should be no big deal, right? Well, the half-life of caffeine in your body is actually about six hours. That means that drinking a big cup of coffee containing 200 milligrams of caffeine at 3 p.m., you know, reasonably early in the day, will actually leave you with about 100 milligrams of that caffeine in your system at 9 p.m. at night, reasonably late. Adenosine reception, which is affected by caffeine, is important to sleep, and especially to deep delta level sleep. You may be able to fall asleep hours after a big cup of coffee, but your body will probably miss out on the benefits of this deep sleep. And your body desperately needs this level of sleep because adenosine is only cleared from the body and glycogen or ATP reserves are only restored during this deep sleep. So not only does the sleep deficit add up fast, but the next day you feel even worse because there's still yesterday's adenosine in your system yet to be cleared. And so you need caffeine as soon as you get out of bed just to feel okay, just to feel at your previous baseline. The cycle continues day after day, snowballing this way. You keep consuming more and more of the drug caffeine to put off an inevitable come down it's a vicious cycle. And as you may know, trying to quit faces you with negative effects that can be enough to even force someone back onto the drug. In addition to leaving you tired and depressed from dysregulated circadian rhythms and built up adenosine, you can also be faced with splitting headaches as blood vessels in the brain dilate. You see, adenosine is a vasodilator, which means it widens blood vessels probably to ensure good oxygenation during sleep. Because it blocks adenosine, caffeine is effectively a vasoconstrictor, meaning it narrows blood vessels. This effect is why some headache medications such as Excedrin contain caffeine. You see, constricting blood vessels in the brain can help stop vascular headaches, but then withdrawing from caffeine often involves headaches because the sudden boost in blood flow from the sudden lack of the vasoconstriction from the lack of caffeine can cause pain. As I've probably indicated by now, caffeine is addictive. Um, you know, as many know, dopamine is a neurotransmitter that activates pleasure centers in certain parts of the brain, which correlates with increased activity of the mesolimbic reward pathway and elevated extracellular dopamine in the nucleus acumens, subcortical structures. Heroin and cocaine manipulate dopamine levels by slowing down the rate of dopamine reabsorption. Caffeine increases dopamine levels in the same way. Now, obviously it's much weaker than, you know, heroin and cocaine, but the mechanism is effectively the same. Researchers suspect that this dopamine connection is what contributes to caffeine addiction, obviously. Therefore, stimulants address a reward deficit. This explains, at least in part, why caffeine is an appetite suppressant. For instance, the compulsion to eat excessively is rectified. This can also complicate your circadian rhythms, however, as is important to eat at the same time as every day. Now, getting back to the sleep discussion, since your brain is struggling to get enough deep delta sleep in order to recycle adenosine as mentioned before it more rarely enters REM sleep. REM sleep is downstream of delta sleep meaning you can only have REM sleep once you've had your fill of delta deep sleep. REM sleep is believed to benefit learning, memory, and mood. It is also thought to contribute to brain development in infants even. A lack of REM sleep may have adverse implications for physical and emotional health now, this all being said, some studies have also shown that there are benefits to caffeine. Regular coffee drinkers were 80% less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. Two cups of coffee a day reduced subjects' risk of colon cancer by 20%. Two cups a day also caused an 80% drop in the odds of developing cirrhosis. Two cups a day cut the risk of developing gallstones in half. Studies have shown that Caffeine is beneficial in treating asthma, stopping headaches, boosting mood, and even preventing cavities. 
And so I think that the takeaway here is not necessarily to forgo caffeine entirely, just to find balance with it. Balance, you know, is what I talk about in most of my videos. Just try to avoid drinking large quantities of caffeine or consuming large quantities of caffeine in any form, especially after 2 p.m., um, you know, because of that half-life I was talking about before being six hours. And from my experience, I found that if you manage your caffeine tolerance effectively, a cup of green tea, about 30, 50 milligrams of caffeine, can effectively feel the same as a cup of coffee, about 100 to 200 milligrams of caffeine. So kind of bringing this to a conclusion now, as I may have made apparent, um, our bodies really are quite susceptible to subtle influences. And beyond light levels and caffeine intake timing, realistically, there's a large variety of other potentialities for circadian rhythm disruption that can lead to insomnia and even depression. You know, just to name a few more, exercising, eating, drinking, too close to bed can inhibit falling asleep and or getting quality sleep as well. Really doing anything too close to bedtime that is more associated with wakefulness than restfulness can have this effect. So just Bear that in mind going forward. Everyone is a little bit different in this regard, but we all are held to a circadian rhythm and cycle. Thank you.